Hello all! Before we begin today's video, please take a moment to hit the subscribe button, leave a like and comment, and share the video. If you have a story you would like me to narrate, just send it to my email, chill.447 at aol.com. Enjoy the video! It's been 23 years since I quit teaching. And this student still scares me. Tommy was a weird kid. Quiet, soft-spoken, almost timid. I was initially worried something was happening at home that was keeping him so walled off from the other kids until I met his folks at a parent-teacher's night at the school. His parents were a very nice young couple and just as eager to ask me about Tommy as I was to ask them. They were just as puzzled about Tommy's soft nature and initially thought he was on the spectrum, although they had yet to have him tested. At recess, Tommy wouldn't interact with the other kids. Instead, opting out to play alone on the swings or drawing pictures in the dirt with a stick until one afternoon. A group of boys in the grade above him got together and decided to make fun of poor quiet Tommy. I saw the whole thing happen from across the playground and began walking over to intervene. One of the kids was a notorious bully, a real gorilla for his age, standing a whole couple heads above other kids. He towered over Tommy with a basketball in hand. I saw him wind up ready to slam dunk onto Tommy's head, but when he let go of the ball, it just hovered there in midair. The ball started to spin, picking up momentum and speed, and went sailing back into the bully's face, breaking his nose and sending him ass over tea kettle to the ground. I was halfway over to them when I saw this. I didn't know what to make of it, but I knew it had something to do with Tommy, who the whole time, mind you, hadn't even looked up from his stick drawing in the dirt. After that, Absolutely nobody interacted with little Tommy, kids, bullies. I even saw ants and other bugs skitter off the other way when he was near. The school I worked in was grades K to 12. So even after Tommy left the first grade, I would still see him around the school. The other staff would congregate in the teacher's lounge at lunches to talk about him and all the weirdness that surrounded him. It's like he could read my mind. I swear, he somehow made all textbooks float up off the desks and hit the floor this morning. Those were just a few of the rumors going around amongst us teachers. I always try to shy away from gossip. What if Tommy could read minds too? What would he do to us if he could see how hated he really was. Things continued on like this for years. I would smile at Tommy whenever I would see him in the hallways, and things remained uneventful until Tommy hit the ninth grade. Tommy had to pair up with a partner for a science lab project, a simple dissection of a frog. From what the teacher of the class told me, he nor anybody else had ever seen Tommy so into anything before. He was actively sharing his excitement over the frog's intestines and bones with his less than enthusiastic lab partner. Unfortunately, this is where everything gets really dark. After the class, nobody could find Tommy, his lab partner, and about a dozen scalpels it was uncommon for students to ditch class, but this was Tommy we're talking about and his missing partner and 12 fucking blades. A few teachers, including myself, 
went to search for him at a recess that day, but it was an unfortunate janitor that found him and the other student. He called all of us to the teacher's lounge, pale-faced and shaking. He said he had called the police and we need to get the students somewhere safe and lock down to school. We all asked what was going on and he told us. He had found Tommy in the upstairs bathroom dissecting his lab partner, only he wasn't doing it himself, the janitor explained. The scalpels were whizzing around Tommy's screaming lab partner, making incisions and pulling out organs as Tommy sketched everything down into a book. When Tommy saw the janitor, he apparently turned around, nonplussed, about the whole thing and said, Oh, hey Mr. S. I was curious about how Mark worked. Is everybody like this on the inside? The janitor apparently mustered up a smile and made an excuse about getting back to work before making like a bat out of hell and racing back to us. We quickly put the school into lockdown the way you would if you had an active shooter in the building. I watched the live feed of the school security cameras from a laptop in the teacher's lounge to see Tommy roaming the empty halls. Locks broke off of lockers as he passed them, while the doors fluttered open and closed frantically like the panicked wings of butterflies. I could see he was visibly confused, probably wondering where everyone had gone. The police and SWAT arrived pretty quickly. I watched the cameras as they surrounded him, automatic rifles pointed at his head, probably yelling at him to get on the ground. When Tommy just nonchalantly turned around to walk the other way, though, they opened fire. The bullets had barely left their guns before stopping mid-air to reposition themselves and continue their trajectory into their owner's skulls. Five SWAT team officers hit the floor, dead. All of the staff was huddled like a coven of witches around the laptop now. A coven of middle-aged teacher salary witches, scared shitless as we saw on screen that Tommy now stood outside the teacher's lounge. We all knew what was coming as the door blasted off its hinges. The faculty panicked and threw any close object they could. Grab towards Tommy, I remember shouts of, Get away from me, you little monster! And, I'm not fucking dying like this. I was supposed to retire to Florida this year! Eyes popped out of skulls. Limbs were ripped from sockets with sick, wet, tearing noises, and teachers sailed around the room in the air so fast and with such force that when they hit the ground, they exploded like a balloon full of jelly. And the whole time, I just crouched in the corner, shaking and terrified. Eventually, I was all that was left alive in the room with Tommy. He made his way over to me, as I was sure it was the end. Mr. H? He spoke my name the way a student would before asking to use the washroom. Where is everybody? Did I do something wrong? I couldn't sugarcoat it. He had spared me to this point, and if nobody was going to tell him what he was doing was wrong, well, how far... Would he take this? How many more lives would he snuff out? Y y yes Tommy. I managed to stammer out. You've killed these people. You understand that's wrong, don't you? I didn't mean to. I was just standing up for myself. I glanced over to the laptop to see more SWAT heading to the teacher's lounge. Tommy, please, I said as softly and kindly as I could under such stress. You have to make up for what you've done, okay? 
Some men are on their way here now to take you somewhere safe. Every crime has a punishment, and what you've done here is a crime. I don't remember my exact words, but they were something like that, and Tommy nodded and raised his hands to the air just as SWAT got to the door. They arrested Tommy, and he remained as calm and emotionless as ever as they led him to an armored truck in the parking lot. The events of that day were largely covered up and Tommy was placed in a high security prison. I would visit him from time to time over the years. He told me I was the only one besides some government officials or FBI types, his words, that ever did. I didn't know why he let himself just sit in that prison year after year. I was thankful about it though. I thought whatever words I managed to squeak out to him before his arrest must have really stuck. He hadn't changed a whole lot mentally either it seemed. He was still very much that quiet kid drawing pictures in the dirt I remembered from long ago. But the reason I'm writing this, the reason I've broken as many years of silence as I have NDAs on the matter is because last night I got a call from the prison. Two guards that patrol Tommy's cell were found dead and he was nowhere to be found. I don't know if he just finally got bored or what. It doesn't help matters that he's grown into the most average, unassuming looking man ever, Caucasian, average height, build, hazel eyes. He could be anywhere right now, and it has been a while since I last visited him. God help me if he decides I hadn't made the right call after all, and he wants payback for all the years he spent just whittling time away behind bars. Tommy, if you're reading this right now, I'm sorry, but I can't ever see you again. I can't see any more people suffer through so much. I know you're probably just confused and maybe even scared right now, but I hope you know to do the right thing. After I post this, I'll be heading into my garage to run a hose from the exhaust of my car through the driver's side window and maybe listen to my favorite REM album one last time. To everybody else, please stay in your homes, lock your doors, and keep your loved ones close. Good luck. As a child, my mother infected me with an extraterrestrial virus. My father died in a car accident when I was still an infant. I never knew him, but instead grew up with my cold, psychopathic mother, who I still despise to this day. Mom worked in a top-secret government laboratory. I don't know when she decided, in her insane, emotionless way, that infecting me with the virus would be beneficial. And while it did ultimately give me some superhuman abilities, the nightmarish side effects ended up being far worse than anyone could ever have imagined. I still remember her taking me down into the lab one dark winter's night nine years ago. We passed through the lonely stairwells, our footsteps eerie and echoing in the silent corridor. This is a big night for you, Mom said, giving me a wide toothy smile. I held her hand tightly, scared of the creeping fingers of shadow that seemed to follow us like the angel of death. A big night for all of us, really. Why? I asked, glancing up at her trustfully. She didn't meet my gaze. She gave an apathetic wave of her hand. Oh, it's a surprise, she answered evasively. A big surprise. 
just like on your birthday. Oh, I love surprises, I said excitedly. Is it a computer? A new video game? You'll see soon enough, honey, Mom said, grinning down at me as if I were a piece of meat. We had descended five or six levels below the ground level by this point. Brown cement walls lined the ceilings, floors and walls. Looking back, it all seems like a concrete prison in my memories, but contained within the laboratory waited something far worse than a prison. We got to the bottom level of the stairs. In front of us loomed a thick steel door. Mom pressed her thumb into the glowing red sensor on the wall. The screen lit up with her credentials and photo. Rosie Emma. An ID picture that flashed across the screen showed her smiling at the camera. Yet her cold eyes never seemed to smile. The door slid open as a smooth female robotic voice rang out. I jumped at the sudden intrusion of sound. Welcome back, Dr. Rossi. It said, its emotionless cadence reverberating from speakers all around us, stretched out far in front of us. I saw cell after cell lining the sides of the hall. Rusted steel bars kept the inmates inside like caged animals. Emaciated, half-naked wretches of human beings moaned in terror or cowered in the corners when they saw Mom walking by. I felt sick and weak just looking at them. I could see all of their ribs, their jutting hip bones, their spines sticking out through the thin, bruised skin like twisting branches. Many had signs of torture or medical experimentation sliced into their flesh. Some had extra limbs or extra eyes. I saw a man who had his legs sawn off and replaced by arms. He crabbed walked across the floor crawling on his four hands in an eerie, inhuman way. I cringed back, hugging Mom's waist tightly. One woman I passed had a slitted reptilian eye surgically inserted into her forehead. A few had some strange flesh-rotting disease. Entire patches of their body gleamed crimson in the fluorescent lights, skinned and bloody, spider webs of bloody gashes cracked and ate their way across their skin. Tortured moans rose into the air all around us. A couple of the prisoners even dared to come forward and plead for help from me. I cowered away, pressing myself close to mom's leg. She gave them a venomous look. At the sight, they instantly retreated back into the shadows of their dark cells. Mom, what is this? Why are they like this? I asked in horror. I could feel my hands shaking, but Mom stayed as calm and still as a statue. Nothing seemed to bother her. Don't worry about them, baby, she said glancing over at a crying woman whose skin had turned a deep blue. Dozens of bony spikes, shaped like wooden stakes, protruded from her head and chest, apparently fused into her skeleton. These are the worst of the worst. They deserve every second of it. They're political prisoners, journalists, enemies of the state. They hate our country, and they hate freedom. Those of us who love this country would do anything to protect it. Anything. Some people don't understand that. She spat the last words at a trembling old man 
with deep infected surgical scars running like train tracks over his legs, arms, and chest. Up ahead, a shatterproof glass door allowed me to see into an expansive room filled with bubbling beakers, freezers full of vials, glowing computers, and blood-stained surgical beds. Mom walked up to the door, pressing her thumb into the sensor again. The door split open down the middle, whirring silently to the sides. The laboratory stood totally still and empty in the middle of the night, except for a few machines that beeped, spun, and sputtered in the far corners of the room. Mom looked like she had just stepped into her true home. Her eyes glittered with excitement. This is where the magic is, she whispered, gripping my hand tighter. This is where it happens, she knelt down next to me, looking me in the face and putting her hand on my shoulder. If you could be exceptional, if you could be stronger and better than everyone else, would you want to? I shrugged, thinking it over in my childish way. Sure, I guess, I said noncommittally. Who wouldn't? She nodded at this. Rising to her feet, she pulled me towards a chair situated at a workspace in the corner with long, confident strides. She made her way over to a freezer that took up the entire back wall of the laboratory. After confirming her thumbprint again, the computer spoke. Authorization successful. It said coolly, in its emotionless, unconcerned way. Level 5 Bioweapons Container Opening I sat in a comfortable chair in front of a black computer screen while Mom searched through the freezer. I heard the tinkling of glass vials as she ran her fingers over them. After a few moments, she gave a faint cry of triumph. Ah, there it is, the serum of life, the manna of God, she said, holding the glass vial in front of her eyes. She stared into its blue swirling contents with adoration, almost worship. She turned to me, her face a reptilian mask of insanity. Do you know what this is? I shook my head, pushing myself back on the rolling chair and away from this strange creature who used to be my mother. She gave me a twisted grin. Well, that's okay. In reality, maybe none of us really do. Do you know what the Black Death was, honey? She asked sweetly. I gave a slight nod. I guess I heard something about it. It made people get sick and die, right? I said, she drew close to me, pulling up a chair. Her normal, comforting smile had returned, but I still felt sick and scared. When she tried to grab my hand, I flinched away. Yes, in the Middle Ages, it made a lot of people get sick and die. The Black Death was a highly deadly disease spread through fleas carried on rats by ships or through trading routes like the Silk Road. But no one back then knew what a virus or a bacteria was. They knew what fleas were, of course, but very few made any connection to the apocalyptical disease slithering its way through their homelands like the Angel of Death. In some places, they thought the Black Death was spread by cats, and they went out and killed all the cats. She gave an ironic laugh at that. They ended up killing the main thing that was doing anything to keep the rat population in check, and so, of course, the Black Death exploded. In their ignorance, they not only did not help themselves, but ensured many more people would die. In fact, people in the medieval period were so afraid 
and confused by the Black Death that some whispered rumors that it could spread just by looking at someone who had the disease. Others said you could get the Black Death by simply thinking about it. They thought it was, perhaps, some kind of mental virus that manifested itself in horrible physical symptoms. She hesitated for a long moment at this. Her expression thoughtful and constrained. She sighed. Well, anyways, that brings me back to this, she said, jiggling the vial held tightly in her hand. The sparkling, thick sludge jumped and sloshed like syrup inside the glass. They were wrong about the Black Death being spread mentally, of course, but they weren't wrong about everything. There are viruses that can spread through consciousness, though perhaps calling them a virus is unfair. Yes, they can have some minor harmful effects, but they also strengthen and revitalize the infected person's mind in the process. They don't want their host body to die, after all. For, you see, a virus that kills its host is a virus that needs to keep jumping rapidly to new subjects. In natural selection, it makes more sense to keep the host alive so they can spread the virus further. I nodded, only understanding a small portion of what she was telling me. Even though I was extremely intelligent for my age, other kids in my class were still reading picture books about the ABCs while I was already reading Stephen King. Mom took a needle from her pocket. She flipped the vial up and down rapidly, swirling the contents. I watched as it clung to the sides of the glass, slowly dripping its way down to the bottom like a slug. She stabbed the needle through. The cerulean liquid sparkled as it filled the syringe. Your arm, she said. I hesitated. Her eyes hardened to granite. I said, give me your arm. I don't want to, I protested. She grabbed me, roughly by the wrist, twisting my hand. I cried out in pain. Before I knew what was happening, she had stabbed the needle into my tricep with a quick practiced flick of her hand. She pressed down on the plunger. It's just a little shot, just like at the doctor, she whispered as a burning pain ran up my arm. It felt like lava was eating its way through my flesh. A ragged scream tore its way out of my throat. I looked down at my arm, and it seemed like white light was tearing its way out through ragged patches of flesh that dissolved as if acid were eating away at them. I heard a high-pitched ringing sound from all around me. The world sounded as if it would collapse from the intensity of it. Everything seemed to be shaking, falling apart. I remember falling. Something started whispering between moments. We can be friends. I heard it hiss as time seemed to slow down. I couldn't see anything anymore. My vision had turned into pulsating circles of white light. I remember inhaling deeply. The world seemed to inhale with me. The infinite radiance that filled the room pushing out like pale hands. I don't think I want to be friends with you. I thought, feeling something cold sweeping over my body like millions of reptilian eyes. If we are one, no one can hurt you, it said in a voice like the white noise of static. I'm not sure if I want that, I thought, and its laugh rang out like a freezing wind. 
I felt myself shaking, my skin shivering. Whether you want it or not, we are one. I will be with you forever and ever. As I opened my eyes, I heard the shrill shrieking of alarms all around me. Strobing lights flashed in rapid blinks. Emergency lights spun casting bloody red glows on the cracked walls and destroyed equipment all around me. I raised my head slowly, groggily. Where my mother had stood, I now saw a pile of rubble. The ceiling had caved in, sloping down like a mountain peak. Chunks of broken concrete and twisted metal beams littered the ground. Throughout the repetitive blaring of the alarms, a female robotic voice spoke. Its candence, as emotionless and flat, as if it were announcing the floors of a rising elevator. Evacuation in progress. It said, Level 5 containment procedures activated. All personnel must evacuate immediately. Containment procedures will begin in 60 seconds. All personnel who do not evacuate the building are subject to critical injury and death. Then the computer began its message over. My heart was hammering in my chest as I pushed myself up off the floor, feeling weak and lightheaded. As I started out the laboratory, I glanced back at my mother's final resting place. I only saw a spreading puddle of blood there. Underneath the twisted beams of steel, lay a pale hand curled up like a desiccated spider. Many of the strange inmates I had seen were dead. Chunks of concrete, shaken loose from the ceilings, had fallen down and crushed some. But in other cells, the bars were twisted. Pale hands reached out as the people inside pleaded and tried to flee for their lives. I glanced over at one cell, seeing something like a shower head poking its way out of an open panel in the wall. In the areas where the ceiling wasn't destroyed, more of the same panels opened, and more of the same devices slithered out. Containment procedure will begin in 30 seconds. Deployment of hydrogen cyanide gas will be contained to level 5 bioweapons area. All personnel must evacuate immediately. The computer said, the cold female voice, almost sounding bored as she spoke, her prophecies of imminent doom, the many strange, surgically altered and tortured people in the cells started shrieking as one. A few had even forced themselves most of the way out in areas where the bars were twisted or broken from the collapse of parts of the building. The door loomed up ahead of me, its bright polished steel hanging open and seeming to encourage me on. I felt a sudden rush of energy as I sprinted out the door. It slammed shut behind me, panting and terrified, I turned to glance back into the hallway. Containment procedure will now begin. The computer announced coldly. All of the shower heads that poked out of the hidden panels like viper heads started spraying some pale blue plumes of fog in every area of the cells. The inmates who, who had broken out into the hallway grabbed at their throats their eyes bulging out of their heads, their muscles straining like taut cords. They fell to their knees or collapsed on their backs as small, frothy trickles of blood escaped from their lips. Their skin shone with a bright pink glow as they died, kicking and seizing, writhing on the ground and choking. They seemed to be silently pleading with terrified dying eyes, as I turned and made my way back towards the stairwell, 
all around me, more destruction shown. Spider webbing cracks, route in the building and collapsing, sections of wall looming up in front of me. And yet, I made it to the door, just as a team of men, clad in gas masks and SWAT gear, raced in. They grabbed me, handcuffed my small hands behind my back, and took me to an idling van outside. I was scared and confused, but I ignored the small whispering voice that seemed to come from deep in the shadows in my mind. I can hurt them if you want. It hissed in its cold, reptilian way. I can kill them. Would you like that? I closed my eyes and ignored the voice that sliced through my mind like a dagger. The van started up and we pulled away. Two men in black suits and dark sunglasses sat across the table from me. The dark room seemed to press in all around me like a coffin. A one-way mirror covered the wall behind them, reflecting darkly. Tell us what happened, the one on the left said, leaning forward. It, it was an earthquake. You know that. You saw the building. I protested. The one on the right smashed his hand against the metal table. I jumped, my heart leaping in my chest. Don't give us that bullshit. The one on the right spat. That was no goddamned earthquake. Why are you the only one left alive in the entire building? You should be dead. You were on the bottom floor. I shrugged trying to make myself look as small as possible. When the earthquake happened, everything fell in front of me, but it stopped where I was standing. It must be God looking out for me or something. I don't know. Oh, yes, God. The one on the left repeated sarcastically. Maybe some sort of God. That was no earthquake, however... The building simply, well, it just seemed to collapse on its own, as if someone had detonated a bomb. We have seen this before. Richard, we know that your mother gave you the serum. Why would she do that? Do you think? The one on the right asked. Was she crazy? Was she trying to kill you? She said something about viruses of the mind, I said. The way the men leaned close to me and hung on my every word scared me more than their anger about how they strengthen the mind because they need the host body to live. They drive the person insane. That's what they do. They take pieces of that person a little more each day until the stronger consumes the weaker. There are certain wasps that lay their brood inside caterpillars, Richard. The larvae hatches and starts eating the caterpillar alive from the inside. But evolution is smart, right? Somehow the larvae knows not to eat the vital organs until the very end. It keeps the caterpillar alive, suffering and dying, for as long as it possibly can. Until it finally decides that its host body has worn out its welcome. Then it finally eats the brain and heart. But in the end, the caterpillar is just a meal. It's not a symbiotic exchange. Do you understand what I mean by this? The one on the left asked. It's important that you understand what I'm about to tell you. I nodded. He inhaled deeply. What your mother gave you is like a wasp larva in a sense he said, and you're the caterpillar. It will ultimately kill you, probably within 10 years. No test subject has ever lasted longer than that. We first found the substance in Greenland back in the 1980s. It had come to Earth in a meteorite hundreds of millions of years ago and lay dormant, frozen under the ice. Yet, an archaeologist excavating the area for dinosaur fossils found the meteorite. It was small, 
only the size of a bowling ball, perfectly round and smooth. It almost looked like a bowling ball, too, black and glassy, but there was something blue and thick leaking out of the bottom. The archaeologist ran the substance between her fingers and brought it up to her nose to smell it. That was when, according to her teammates, she started to change. After a few seconds, her eyes widened and started pulsating with blinding light. She screamed, and two voices seemed to come out of her mouth, arguing and shrieking at each other. The earth had begun to shake, then and the glacier started to split apart. Out of the entire excavation team of ten people, only three survived, her and two others. But she was the only one totally unharmed. Once we heard what had happened, we immediately brought her back to the U.S. and put her under containment. Within days, she began to exhibit certain behaviors, telepathy, telekinesis, the ability to create fire from nothing, among other stranger talents. The CIA came in and, against our advice, took her out for use as a secret weapon against America's enemies. They sent her alone into areas filled with terrorists, insurgents, or soldiers of opposing states. She always returned alive, leaving behind countless corpses that were burnt, electrified, and crushed. It seemed like a good deal, but she was also slowly losing her mind. She began to argue with herself more and more, always in two different voices. One sounded like her own, but the other seemed to be staticky, like a voice on the radio stuck between stations, and from what we know about her death, apparently, on the way back from a mission, she got in an argument with herself and blew up the entire plane, killed everyone on board. This wasn't an unusual fate. Since then, the CIA has injected quite a few others with the virus, and it always ends the same way. Why are you telling me this? I asked, horrified. The man on the right grinned. Because realistically, you only have one choice, he said. You can work for the government like those before you, kept under constant surveillance and contained, or you can be executed. People like you are far too dangerous to ever release. I felt a rising sense of anger and bloodlust within me at their tone and threats. It spiraled up my spine like a snake. I felt waves of energy sizzling across my skin. I didn't know where my feelings stopped and the others began anymore. You think you can threaten me? I said, my head pounding. Everything seemed to turn white as I heard screaming all around me. I heard the reptilian laughing of that other voice inside and then I blinked. The two agents stood in front of me their bodies on fire, they ran blindly in circles, their agonized wails reverberating across the small, claustrophobic room like a tornado siren. I watched their eyes melt from their sockets as liquid fat ignited and dripped off their bodies. Their skin blackened as their cries weakened. Finally, Mercifully, they fell and went silent, their bodies still smoking and charred. I rose, feeling light and free. I looked down at my own body, watching as currents of electricity danced and waved their way across my skin. I closed my eyes, focusing on the locked door in front of me. With a sudden will and a channeling of the energy, I felt like a burning heat within me. I put out my hand in front of me. 
the wall cracked down the middle and the door flew off its hinges. It smashed into the wall behind it with a sound like a gunshot. I walked out into the hallway where more agents with guns drawn started screaming orders at me. Closing my eyes, I heard the laughing of the other as the building collapsed around us. The ceilings fell in a cacophony of smashing and breaking, crushing the bodies of those below with a wet crunch. I heard terrified shrieking and moans of pain as the avalanche of rubble slowed. I turned back down the hallway, snaking my way through destroyed corridors until I found an emergency exit. I pushed it open, seeing the bright sunlight beaming down. We are one, I heard the voice say. I looked out into the world with wonder, seeing patterns of energy tracing their way through the sky and the rolling hills that I had never perceived before. And as the two of us walked out together, everything seemed bright and scintillating, a brave new world.